Hello everyone, welcome to our webcast today. It's 10 o'clock here in Montana, so we're going to go ahead and get started. I'm Cheryl Rogers, the Director of Marketing here at Golden Helix. Bryce Christensen, our Director of Services, will be giving today's webcast, and we will be taking a look at using haplotypes in ROH to get more from GWAS. Bryce, take it away. Okay. Cheryl, thank you for the introduction. I too would like to welcome our audience today. As Cheryl said, today we're going to talk a little bit about how you might be able to learn a little bit more about some of the signals that might be hiding in your GWAS data by looking beyond individual SNP associations and considering features that involve multiple SNPs. Along the way, if you have any questions, feel free to enter them in the GoToWebinar question and answer panel. We'll respond to as many of those as we can at the end of today's presentation. For anyone who's not familiar with our company, we've been in business for several years providing software and services to the genetic data analysis and bioinformatics industries. If you look on our website at goldenhelix.com, you'll find nearly a thousand citations that have been published citing our software and services if you want to learn a little bit about how people have used our products. Now, we do have three different software products that we provide. Just to give you a quick overview, the first is Genome Browse. Genome Browse is completely free. You can download it and use it today. It is a visualization tool for looking at DNA and RNA sequencing data supports most standard bioinformatics formats like BAM files and VCF files and so on. We recently launched a brand new product called Varseq. It's something that we're very excited about. Varseq is a very powerful platform for annotating, filtering, and visualizing DNA sequence data. It's really optimized for clinical applications and also has extensive applications in research use as well. Now today, mostly we're going to talk about the SNP and Variation Suite, or SVS. SVS has been our flagship product for several years. It's a very powerful platform for working with many different types of genetic data, particularly SNP data or genotype analysis, as it's labeled here for GWAS. And during the presentation today, we'll spend quite a bit of time interactively looking at some of the features in SVS. Things I'd like you to pay attention to especially are the visualizations and the flexibility of the software for working with different data types and addressing different hypotheses in your data. So as we go along, we'll start out with a basic overview of GWAS and some various aspects of genome-wide association studies. From there, we'll move into a discussion of haplotypes and haplotype analysis options, followed by a discussion of ROH, or runs of homozygosity, and what that is and what you are able to do in SVS in relation to ROH features. So GWAS, of course, has been a core part of our software offerings for a long time, and we've given a lot of previous presentations on this. If you are interested in learning more about aspects of our software for things like quality assurance or more advanced statistical testing options like our mixed modeling features, or want to see just some general information about how it works with GWAS, you can find several recorded presentations available on our website, goldenhelix.com. Now, GWAS, as hard as it might be to believe, has been around now for over a decade. And really, I would say for most of the past 10 years, it's been the go-to technology for gene-finding research. If you have a disease and you want to find the genes that drive that disease, GWAS has been really the probably the most popular thing over this past decade. Now when you look at what has been published, most of the results that you'll find in the literature are relatively common variants that have a pretty small effect on the phenotype, whether that is a disease phenotype or some other outward human trait. Now, GWAS technology really is focused on common variant associations. 
it makes sense that you won't find too many common variants with a large effect size. If so, we would have a much greater disease burden in the population. But there's always um, some challenge to identifying the true causal variants in a GWAS experiment. When you look at the basic structure of GWAS, it's really based on tag SNPs. So we know or we expect that there is some variant somewhere in the genome that has a causal effect on a disease outcome. But we also know that we're using arrays that have fixed content. They might be testing a half million SNPs. They might be testing five million SNPs. But generally speaking, this causal variant may not always be on the array. And so we hope that there's some nearby SNP in an LD or linkage disequilibrium relationship, essentially a SNP that has correlated alleles with that causal variant, and that we'll be able to identify the association between the observed SNP and the disease to inform us where we might look to find the causal variant. And this concept of tagging SNPs is a major consideration in the design of the GWAS arrays that we use. But still, there are always going to be some variants that are poorly represented on the arrays. They're poorly tagged. And for whatever reason, then, we end up with missing heritability. We have evidence that there is a genetic association, but we can't identify it when we are doing these single marker tests. It, you know, when you really think about it, if this causal effect has a very low effect size, low odds ratio, like we see often in GWAS, you might need a pretty large sample size to detect it, even if you directly have genotyped that causal SNP. And if you're relying on LD to identify the causal SNP and you don't have a really strong um, LD relationship there to tag that causal variant, there's a broad opportunity to miss your target. And so what, what can we do? Can we learn more from the existing data? Can we go beyond those single marker associations and maybe capture a little bit more of the signal if in fact it exists? It'd be nice if we could just collect massive sample sizes or if we could do whole genome sequencing on all of our data. Unfortunately, that's not always possible, as we know. But when you really break it down and look at it, using combinations of neighboring markers might give a better representation of some of those ungenotyped SNPs. And this is not a new concept. It's been in use for quite a long time. But it's recognized that haplotypes may capture greater allelic diversity than individual SNPs. When you look at an individual SNP, you have allele 1, allele 2, but if you take three or four or ten consecutive SNPs and look at the combinations in which they occur, you might find dozens of well-conserved alleles which may in fact um, be better at tagging some of those SNPs that we didn't capture on our genotyping platform. Another way of looking at it might be runs of homozygosity, which is distinctly different from haplotype analysis, but it's another way to capture associations that are only evident when you look at several SNPs together as opposed to analyzing them one by one. And we'll talk about both of those as we go along here today. So what is a haplotype? The simplest definition I can come up with is that it's a set of sequential alleles found on a single chromosome. Of course, the human genome is diploid. There are two copies of each chromosome. And often in GWAS, we're looking at genotypes where we know the first allele and the second allele, but we don't necessarily know which one came from which parent and which one was inherited together with the various alleles uh, before and after that SNP on the chromosome. Now, haplotypes, when you look at it, tend to be conserved pretty well across generations and populations, and this is largely because meiotic recombination is not really random. There are known hotspots where recombination, recombination events are more likely to occur, and between those hotspots, 
sequences are pretty well preserved. There's fewer opportunities for um, for haplotypes to be mixed up, and as such, they remain well conserved from generation to generation and throughout populations. Some of these haplotypes can be traced back many, many thousands of years in some cases. So if we have a well-conserved haplotype, then it may be able to tell us that there is some unseen variant that remains on that haplotype that we just haven't genotyped. So testing for haplotypes might give us a window onto disease susceptibility loci. So when we look at it, this is an image that might represent three individuals, each of whom have two copies of the chromosome, which results in two haplotypes. And if we assume that at this position of our causal SNP, that perhaps the C allele is driving the disease, if we look at the big picture, you might recognize that the C allele always occurs on a haplotype of AGA from these other three variant positions while the T allele at that position occurs in other combinations with the various SNPs. So if we can break down the data such that we can recognize that consistent AGA pattern and test for that haplotype versus all others, then we might be able to identify the, the association which would not have been evident simply from looking at SNP A over here on the left or either of these two SNPs on the right. And I'll just point out while we're here, this is also the theoretical basis for genotype imputation. When we do imputation, we start out with this reference panel of a phased haplotypes, whether it's from the Thousand Genomes Project or some other reference panel. We match up those haplotypes with the haplotypes observed in our data and then fill in the blanks based on the most similar haplotypes. So let's go ahead now and move over to SVS and just look a little bit more at how this haplotype structure presents itself. So SVS is a project-oriented software tool. I'm going to open a project that already has a lot of data in it. The data we're looking at today is from the Illumina 2.5M genotyping platform. The data comes from the or sorry, the 1000 Genomes Phase 3 project. And what I have done here is to select just the European samples. There are 649 of them in this data set. The entire SNP set consists of about 2.5 million SNP markers. I applied some simple filters based on call rate and allele frequency, reduced it to just over a million SNPs that are highly polymorphic. I'll make a subset of those. And in SVS, we have the ability to just click one button and start to see LD patterns across a genomic region. So what we see in this image across the top edge, each of these vertical bars represents a particular SNP. And as I hover over, you see the name of the SNP being displayed. And down in this triangular and very colorful plot, we have a representation of the linkage disequilibrium. Red colors indicate strong relationships where you can pretty well predict the alleles at one SNP based on the observed alleles at another. Blue indicates the lack of that kind of correlation structure. And if I pick one of these, perhaps this large red block right here and click on it, SVS tells me what are the two SNPs that I've just selected and what is the strength of the LD relationship. In this case, we see an R squared of about 96%. I can look elsewhere, perhaps right here in this pinkish block and see a somewhat weaker relationship, about 55%. Now, as we back out a little bit, you'll start to recognize some distinct and relatively independent triangular patterns with the LD. And that's representing this idea of LD blocks. There's a limit to how far 
in LD region can stretch. Partly that's because of recombination, so you might assume that right in this area between these two major red triangles is a place where recombination has occurred frequently enough over time that there's just no correlation across that. And we can see this visually as well. I can add in an annotation source. This comes from the HapMap project. You might say this is the crowning achievement of the HapMap project in some ways. But as we draw this in, and I'll just add a connecting line to make it more obvious, this is the observed recombination rate that was calculated from the HapMap project. They went through all of these family trios where you can pretty well directly observe haplotype status. They can see where recombination occurs within families during meiotic events. And they can calculate the rate. So here we see this is a known recombination hotspot. And there is no evidence of strong LD relationships spanning that point. And we can move around and find similar hotspots all over the place where we're pretty well consistent with what's being reported by HapMap. Now, as we explore the data, quite often we might find a block of SNPs that we're interested in learning more about. SVS gives you the option to manually identify groups of SNPs. And here I've outlined them in this green, this green pentagon. And when I click within the pentagon now, it tells me what are the most common haplotypes occurring in that region, together with the frequency at which they occur. So in this case, there are three relatively common haplotypes. As we move around, we might find other locations that we want to learn about. Let's try this one. And now, in this block of 12 markers, there are several common haplotypes. Now, if I want to learn more about those haplotypes, maybe find out which haplotype each sample carries, I have the option to compute haplotype tables here. And now I get this table where sample by sample, I can see the probability of each sample having each haplotype. This is an inherently probabilistic process. We don't directly observe haplotypes. We have all of these independently measured genotypes in GWAS data. But you can see, for example, on the second row, 0 0.5, 0 0.5, exactly half of the probability in each of those two haplotypes, indicating the sample appears to be heterozygous for those two haplotypes. But we also see here in row four, about 45% on each of two haplotypes, about 5% on another. So there's sometimes a little bit of ambiguity. We can't always directly determine exactly which haplotype each sample has. So let's um, come back to our slides here for a moment. And talk about how this works. So the phase, as we call it, is generally unknown in GWAS data. Phase just refers to which variants or which alleles were inherited together from each parent. And the process of inferring haplotypes or phasing is based on probability. So we know the relative frequency with which each allele occurs. We know how often they occur together in samples. And if we have a large sample size, we can start to statistically reconstruct those combinations and figure out which alleles seem to always be inherited together and probabilistically assign haplotypes to each sample in our data set. Of course, that accuracy gets better the more samples we have. Family data, if you have it, makes the process a whole lot more accurate. But, um, you know, once we know, um, you know, what data we have, we have to figure out, you know, the algorithmic process to determine this. 
So within SVS, there are two different algorithmic options available for determining haplotypes. With the example we just saw, we were using the default method, which is the EM algorithm or expectation maximization. This gives a maximum likelihood estimate of sample haplotype probability. It is an iterative process that uses a sampling procedure to identify the, the best fit, if you will. And it's the default method in SVS, and it's perhaps the most similar to what tends to be used elsewhere. The second method available is the compound haplotype method. This one's a little bit faster because it's directly computed. Um, it may, in some cases, not be quite as accurate as EM, but it's also an interesting option to try out. Now, once we have our algorithm figured out for phasing the haplotypes, we need to have some way of determining where the haplotype blocks actually reside. So which blocks are worth testing and looking into. The first way of doing that we already saw in the genome browse. We were able to manually identify a few haplotype blocks and generate some information about them. This is especially useful if you're following up on regions of interest. Maybe you have some candidate genes that were previously identified and you just want to go in and see what the haplotype structure looks like and perhaps run some association tests. That's your first option. The second option here, automated detection of LD blocks through the genome, is represented by this little screen capture from SVS. SVS has an algorithmic approach that allows you to specify a few parameters in regard to the frequency of SNPs that are included in haplotypes, the maximum size of haplotype blocks, and it will then identify a list of haplotype blocks that you can use as the basis for ongoing association tests. The third option, which is one that I'm rather fond of is the sliding window approach where you can scan through the data SNP by SNP and using that SNP as the starting point you can either have a fixed number of SNPs that are put into a haplotype or you can have a window size in kilobase pairs so maybe you want to use 10, 20, 50 kilobases, 100 kilobases as the basis for your haplotype. And it will iteratively identify all of the haplotype combinations in that window and allow you to calculate association tests for each one. And this is a pretty exhaustive approach, gives very comprehensive output. So in terms of doing the actual association tests in SVS, there are two primary functions available. When you look at them in the menus, one is called haplotype association tests, the other is called haplotype trend regression. The first option is exclusively for binary traits. It is based on a chi-square testing procedure. One of the useful things about it is you can choose whether it gives results per haplotype or per haplotype block. That is, when you test per block, it will tell you this group of five SNPs or this group of three SNPs has some association with the trait, whereas if you test by haplotype, it will break it down and say there are six different haplotypes in this group of SNPs and one of them is very significantly associated with the trait while the others are not. So you can see it both ways. Haplotype trend regression is a bit different. It's able to work with either quantitative or binary traits. It allows for covariate adjustment, which gives you a lot of flexibility in your analysis. By default, it tests per block rather than per haplotype, but there is an option to get detailed output about some of those individual haplotypes as well. So with that, let's jump back over to SVS here for a minute and take a closer look at this. So I've already done quite a bit of work through here calculating haplotype blocks in the data, running association tests per block and per haplotype also ran a single marker GWAS type test in advance. And let's start by taking a look at just the results of that. So with this particular GWAS analysis, you'll notice that there's not any really strong association apparent in the data. We're looking at a plot of negative log 10 p-values, usually to declare 
significance with a with the number of tests that are being done in a GWAS, you would look for a result around five times ten to the minus eight. That's the standard rule of thumb. That would put it just off the top of the plot here, and we clearly don't have anything in that range. Now, with this particular data using the exact same binary trait as input, if I run the haplotype association tests reporting results per block using those pre-computed blocks, I get a somewhat different result. So here we see on chromosome 9 there's a very strong signal coming out. As we come in and take a closer look at it, there's maybe some evidence of some kind of something going on around this gene, but it's not reaching the level where it would have been noticeable without doing the haplotype test. Now, if we want to learn more about this particular feature, there are different ways to do it. We could add in the same LD plot that we were looking at earlier. In this case, I will get the set of SNPs used as input for the haplotype association testing add that into the plot. From here now, we'll zoom in just a bit closer to our result, I can add in a representation of all of the haplotype blocks that were identified using the automated process. So here we see all of these black pentagons representing the individual blocks. And now we can recognize it appears to have been this block that was generating the strongest result. If we take a closer look at it here, we see that that marker block has an ID number, 63599. If I want to go back and find um, more information about the individual haplotypes there, you'll remember that we did have test results per haplotype as well. And if I look at those results per haplotype, in this case I've already uh, scroll down to that particular block, that 63599, you'll see there are four haplotypes here that are part of that. And we can look at the p-values for each one. See one of them here has this p-value 9 times 10 to the minus 13th, extremely strong association. The EM frequency estimates for that haplotype show an overall frequency of about 11.6%. Over 17% in cases, less than 5% in controls. You can see why that's driving the association. It's a very stark difference in frequency. So what we might then assume is that if we take a closer look at that haplotype, maybe do imputation on this region, we might find that there are some additional SNPs that are not observed in the GWAS but are present on that haplotype that might be driving the actual disease association. Now while we're here, one other kind of interesting way to look at the data, or actually there's two more ways I want to show. One is with this idea of a moving window haplotype test, and let's collapse down the LD plot here for a moment. I mentioned that you can either use the pre-computed haplotype blocks or use a moving window approach. And that's what we see with this is a moving window based on six SNPs. And one thing to keep in mind is that with this sliding window approach, the individual tests are not independent of one another. There's so much overlap in the content from one test to the next that you see this rather distinct pattern with the signal rising and falling with this sort of autocorrelation from point to point. Another way to look at this in SVS, uh, which is different from haplotype analysis, but it's also often very revealing, is that the regression analysis module in SVS has an option to do a sliding window regression considering a, some specified number of markers where you can use a stepwise regression function to build out a model of the optimal SNP set to represent the 
trait association within that window of SNPs. So in this case, I used a moving window of 10 markers. There was no attempt to phase haplotypes at all, but it's still able to capture some of these association signals. So if I look at this one and look at the output results, it shows that within the sliding window of 10 SNPs, it selected three of them to build a multiple regression model that gives a very strong association. So it's just another way to look at the data and maybe identify where haplotype inference might improve the result, or it might also identify places where imputation could improve your result as well. So let's go ahead now and back out of SVS. I think we've given haplotype analysis a pretty thorough treatment. And come back to our slides. So the next major area of functionality that I'd like to discuss is ROH, or runs of homozygosity. Simply put, ROH identifies homozygous chromosomal segments of some specified minimum length. In the image over here on the right, we're looking at a set of samples within a narrow region of chromosome one, and each of these horizontal bars is representing a location or a region where a particular sample is entirely homozygous throughout the area. This can mean different things. Uh, most typically, the assumption is that it's a marker for autozygosity or that there is a particular long haplotype that has been inherited due to some consanguineous relationship and therefore it could be considered a marker for recessive trait inheritance or some kind of um, inbreeding associated trait. But it can also capture some other things as well. One of the interesting aspects of ROH is that it doesn't necessarily require samples to have the same alleles. It just requires that they are all showing long homozygous stretches in the same general location. And as such, it can give associations to a locus that aren't necessarily an association to a particular allele. And when you look at it from that perspective, it actually has a lot in common with linkage statistics as opposed to association statistics. And it can help us to refine chromosomal regions that are being inherited together or segregating together with a particular disease. So within SVS, the options for ROH are fairly straightforward. You need to specify some minimum chromosomal length in kilobases that you want to look for as being entirely homozygous. You also have the option of just basing it on a certain number of consecutive SNPs if you prefer. There are some options then to allow for sporadic heterozygotes to appear. There's always some amount of genotyping error in these things, so you might want to allow a few hets, you might want to allow a few missing genotypes within that stretch. And also, you can specify a maximum gap between consecutive SNPs in a run, so if you don't want your runs to span across centromeres, for example, you can arrange it to do so. Then the outputs that you get at that point. There are some differences in the outputs and how you might use them. The first thing that you get is this ROH segment list where you see the sample ID, chromosome start, chromosome, and how many SNPs are in the region. It's just a list output showing all of the identified features. A tip for some of our more experienced SVS users is that the format of that list is really similar to the output format that you get with copy number analysis. And as such, there are a couple of analysis tools in the copy number menu that are really useful with ROH, and I'll show you an example of that here in a minute. There's another output that is the binary ROH status spreadsheet. This is a table that has the same dimensions as your input genotype table, 
but each genotype is replaced either with a zero or a one to indicate whether or not that locus is part of an ROH segment for that particular sample. This one can be merged together with your phenotypes and used as the basis for association testing. So if you want to do a locus by locus test as to whether or not homozygosity at that position is associated with the trait, that would be one way to do it. Then there are also some optional outputs for clustering the runs of homozygosity. There are some different options here, but in general, what it is, is it allows you to specify a minimum number of samples that need to have overlapping ROH segments in order for that region to become interesting and something that you want to do association tests on. And there are options for calculating optimal clusters with the optimal clustering. It looks at the initial clusters, determines whether or not they are in fact a single feature or if it's multiple overlapping features and breaks it out accordingly. Also an option for determining clusters based on a haplotype similarity. And these can all be used for association testing purposes as well. The advantage there is that you end up with a smaller number of tests to do, so your multiple testing burden may not be quite as large as it would be just using the um, full binary ROH status table. So let's swing back over to SVS and see what this looks like in practice. So we already ran ROH on this data and have several of the outputs here. I'll start by opening that segment list that we just mentioned. So here you see if we sort this by sample. Sample by sample, we see where that sample's segments reside. So this first one on chromosome one from position A to position B has an ROH event that spans 130 SNP markers. And it's a total of about 581 thousand base pairs. Now what you might do with this, if you want to get some summaries on it, in the numeric menu under the copy number output analysis options, there are a few useful features here. Because these formats are similar, you can use things like this count number of segments per sample, where we can see now how many ROH segments were identified sample by sample. You might plot this and see what that distribution looks like and recognize it's fairly normal, perhaps a few low outliers here. If you want to compare that distribution with your phenotype and see if there's an excess burden of ROH events in one sample or another, Data merges in SVS are always quick and easy here, so I can combine it with my phenotype table. And because this is thousand genomes data, I have this population variable. So maybe if I want to compare segment count to population, I can use my numeric column statistics. And in this case, I'll just calculate the mean per group and maybe the standard deviation as well. And what we can see now, if we look at this a little bit, is the Finnish group has an average of 141 ROH events per sample as compared to the um, Italian group over here, this Tuscan Italian group at 123, so a much smaller mean number. And if we explored a little bit more, we might be able to find out that there are some significant differences between population groups or between phenotypic groups as well. Now, back in the segment list, another really useful feature that we can borrow from copy number analysis is this idea of a sparse segment matrix. What it will do is convert this list into more of a matrix style output that can be used in visualization so that we can get really nice clean visuals of where these ROH segments occur. I will go ahead and merge this with the phenotypes as well. 
so that we have it. And we'll, we'll come back and look at that in just a moment. First, I want to look at this other output. So here we get the binary status output that I mentioned. And you can see quite clearly that it's all just a bunch of mostly zeros and occasionally we'll find something like this where you see all of the ones indicating this chromosomal region and I can open the marker map to see where we are. This chromosomal region is entirely homozygous in that particular sample. So this can be merged with phenotypes as well and used as the basis for running association tests. I've already done that and have some results down here at the bottom. Let's open it up and take a look at those. So first of all, what we're seeing here is a regular single marker GWAS result. This time it's based on a different phenotype in the same data, but it's still a case control binary phenotype. And once again, we see that there's nothing particularly significant in this data. If we were just running a GWAS on this, we'd look at it and say, we barely have anything beyond 10 to the minus fifth. That's not going to count for any sort of genome-wide significance. What else can we do? So let's look at ROH. So let's also just pick a single chromosome, take a closer look at this. What we see here, are the p-values for the runs of homozygosity test. And this is based on a Fisher's exact test doing just a case control association with that binary output table. Down here at the bottom, we have actual count data. So we can see how many cases and how many controls have an ROH event at each position through the genome. And right in this area, we see the signal kind of peaks out where we have the maximum difference between cases and controls. Now, um, if we want to look at that other data that we generated a moment ago that we set aside, that sparse segment matrix, that is really nice to visualize in this context. So if we create a heat map from that matrix, when it draws in here now, and I'm just going to move it down below where it can be compared more directly with this. This can be grouped by case control status. And what we recognize now is the blue axis is capturing controls. The green axis is where the cases are. As we look at it, we can visually see a greater density of these ROH events in the case group as opposed to the control group. We already had the plot up here, but it's nice to see it visually. As we zoom out and look at it, we'll also notice that these events are not at all rare. And depending on the population you're working with and the size of ROH features you're looking for, you'll see different patterns. But there are certainly some highly conserved regions where ROH events may occur routinely. It's been shown that in European populations, it's not at all uncommon to have um, up to four megabase segments of ROH appearing in the genome. As we move out further, you'll also occasionally see some really large ROH features. And I might need to make this bigger so that we can see some of these. So I'll expand it out a bit. But you will occasionally find places where, and let's see if we can get one here, where you have entire chromosomes or half of a chromosome. Oops, okay, there we go that are showing some kind of homozygosity event. And we see a few of them scattered around in here of these really large but rare events. One of the unique things about GWAS chips is that if there is either a large deletion on a chromosome and there's only one copy present, or if you have a loss of heterozygosity event, the genotypes through that region will all be called as homozygotes. 
as a result of that, then it will show up in your ROH analysis. And so you can sometimes use ROH as a proxy to identify either loss of heterozygosity events or to identify large heterozygous deletions without necessarily doing um, copy number analysis on them. Okay, so let's go ahead and close out here. Come back to our slides and wrap things up for the day. So what have we learned today? We've learned that sometimes, you know, the old saying goes, you can't see the forest for the trees. Sometimes you're looking for an individual tree and the forest gets in the way. And I think that's what happens often with GWAS. There's a signal in there, but it just is hard to see without adjusting your approach a little bit. So haplotype analysis, other methods that consider multiple SNPs may, in some cases, reveal associations that weren't evident in a standard GWAS approach. ROH, runs of homozygosity analysis, can also be useful in some cases to identify recessive trait loci, as well as other genomic features, such as um, loss of heterozygosity events and deletions and so on. And above all, hopefully you've been able to recognize today that SVS is a very powerful platform for analysis of GWAS data with all of the options for single SNP analysis, for haplotype analysis, for ROH, for advanced regression techniques, and everything else that you might want to do with your GWAS data. So if you have any questions about the software, want more information about it, feel free to contact us through our website at goldenhelix.com or email us. And Cheryl, if you're still with us, I believe you may have some announcements for us. I am still with you, Bryce. Thank you. Um, I do see a few questions rolling in. If you haven't had a chance to type yours in, go ahead and do that now. Um, I will have the webcast recording and slides up Friday, hopefully, at the very latest. Our next scheduled webcast will be coming up on March 11th, and it will be presented by our CEO, Dr. Andreas Scheer. The webcast will build on his recent ebook, Genetic Testing for Cancer, and he will detail what a workflow in a testing lab looks like using our latest product, Farseek. If you're interested in accessing that ebook, you can find it on our website. Um, just go to the tab at the top and click on Resources. Um, lastly, but not least, if you're going to TriCon in a few days, be sure to check out my blog post yesterday on R2 SNPs, and there you can get more information on the talks and short course that will be given by Andreas and Gabe Rudy. Uh, with that, Bryce, I will hand it back to you for questions. Okay. So we definitely have some, some interesting questions to talk about here. Two of them are really related. Can SVS perform imputation, and can we just run imputation instead of the haplotype or homozygosity? That's, um, haplotypes and imputation naturally go hand in hand together. SVS does not do imputation directly. We do have some options available to help you format your data to use any of the popular imputation softwares that are available. Now, I would suggest that doing haplotype analysis as a first pass is a much simpler process than going through the process of imputation. And most of the time, not always, but very often it will identify the same loci that might harbor some kind of a an unseen variant. One of the real um, ironies, I guess you would say, an irony of imputation is that you can't impute a variant that is not already tagged within your GWAS data. And if it's already tagged well in the GWAS data, it's likely that you've already been able to detect it with your initial GWAS and or through haplotype analysis. By doing the imputation, yes, it might help you to refine exactly which variant might be the best candidate for causing the disease, but I've found that it's very unusual that you would 
detect an entirely new locus through imputation that you didn't already have some idea was associated. Now, um, could an apparent ROH be caused by a deletion on one chromosome? That question came in a little earlier before I directly addressed the question, and yes, absolutely, it could be a hemizygous deletion, which is making an ROH event occur. Another question, I'm working with plants. Do you think you have a plan to implement your algorithm for non-diploid genomes? At the moment, we're only able to support diploid genomes or other genomes that can be represented well as diploid, so haploids in particular can work pretty well in SVS. Um, hopefully, we'll be able to offer you something soon, but I can't make any guarantees there. What is the optimum density of SNPs for conducting haplotype analysis? That is a really good question. Um, I know especially we have quite a few customers working with low density arrays that are available for some species, whether you're working with plants or animals or whatnot, where maybe you only have 50,000 or 60,000 SNPs across the genome. The question then becomes whether or not the density is sufficient that you will have multiple SNPs occurring within any of these historic haplotype blocks where you can really pick up the signal. And that's going to vary from genome to genome and from species to species. So obviously higher density is best, but I can't necessarily say exactly what that optimum target density needs to be. Um, can the software conduct a GWAS using mixed linear models? Absolutely. We support, in particular, the MX method for mixed linear model analysis in GWAS, as well as MLMM, and some other mixed model implementations with uh, GBLOP and genomic prediction. Would haplotype analysis be valid and feasible for an ethnically diverse sample? And are there specific corrections you would suggest for that scenario? So in general, when you're working with diverse populations, uh, there are a couple approaches that work well to account for that. There's some power loss that comes with it, but either principal components, corrections, or the mixed model approach that we just talked about can be used to um, adjust for that population structure. With haplotypes, we do have the option through haplotype trend regression to adjust for principal components, although I don't believe that our current mixed model implementation would allow for direct analysis of haplotypes as input. It's really designed for working with genotypes. A related question, can we do PCA using haplotypes? Um, no, not directly. Can we evaluate evidence for selection sweeps with ROH data with SVS? Um, I would probably need to talk to you about that a little more to learn uh, what exactly you're referring to with the selection sweeps and how you'd like to use it, but in general, SVS is really flexible in uh, working out some of those more advanced workflows. Um, another question, should haplotype analysis be done only per block for GWAS? How about per haplotype? You can generate results either way, either per block or per haplotype. Um, the biggest difference is really just going to be in the number of tests that you're performing and the amount of time and the amount of output that is uh, required. Um, can I use the software for canine HD SNP analysis? Absolutely. Um, really, any diploid genome is going to be supported in SVS. We have customers using dozens and dozens of different organisms, and canine is a pretty well, um, well annotated genome that we can definitely work with. All right, so um, there are a few other questions here that might be better directly answered later on. Are there any GWAS data using ROH or haplotype of type 2 diabetes? I'm sure there are. I can't give you any 
um, any references off the top of my head, but that's something we can talk to you about a little bit later on. So I think we can go ahead now and wrap this up. I'd like to thank everyone again for attending today. Thank you for sticking around to the end and wish you all success with your research pursuits wherever they may lead you. Thanks again.